With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. And welcome in, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this Thursday. We are here in the News Radio 1440 uh, studios with Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, any way that you're listening to us. We appreciate you joining us on this Thursday. And this is a big day in the state of Alabama. And as always, Thursdays is a big day for us, too, because we have waiting on the line right now our special guest, Becky Gerritsen of Eagle Forum, Alabama. Welcome in. Hello. Hello, Caleb. Thanks for having me on again. Uh, great to have you on. So um, I know that it's very rare that our state winds up in the national media this much. And of course, that's the, the story on everybody's mind. So uh, give us sort of a rundown of what was going on within the Senate when this whole brouhaha over the abortion ban bill was taking place. Wow, what a night it was. Um, it was so great to be there, but it was so interesting. Of course, the, the debate took place on the Senate floor. It had already passed the House a couple of weeks ago. Mm. So I was up in the gallery, and the honest truth was there were about 90% abortion activists or pro-choice people, and about 10% of us that were pro-life people. And as soon as it began, it was the gallery was filled before the four o'clock when they gaveled in and to begin debate, it was already full. And when Clyde Chambliss, the sponsor of the Senate bill, came came up to the mic and started talking, people in the gallery just started laughing, like making fun of him laughing. And it was so rude. I was really upset about it because there, there's a lot of decorum that takes place. You're, you're supposed to be on good behavior mm. when you're up there in that gallery. And um, a couple of times, in the very beginning, when, when someone else would talk that the pro-abortion people liked, then they would cheer. And Senator Figures is a Democrat who these people love. Um, she actually came up to the gallery, and she made an announcement. She said, guys, you need to calm down up here because they will kick you out, and I want everyone to be able to see what happens tonight. So and basically, they, they were treating it like you. a sporting event, like they were yeah, a football game. I mean, yes, it was just, it was not the professional kind of thing that you see that takes place there. You know, even though there's a lot of times there's a lot of craziness that goes on the floor down below and you're thinking these guys are elected and they're down there looking at Facebook and joking around. And, but up in the gallery, you know, people are pretty, they're pretty quiet. They're watching what's happening. So it, mm -hmm. I was a little frustrated. Um, they did calm down after Senator figures came up there and told them to be quiet. Um, but as the night went on, they began to get kind of loud. And there was a person sitting behind me that when Senator Chambliss would say something that he didn't like, he would say the BS word as if he were sneezing or coughing and say it loud enough that, of course, I knew exactly what he was saying. Um, right. And anyway, that's just kind of the people that I think we were dealing with that night. But um, Clyde Chambliss did a great job explaining the bill. The Democrats. Um, all had their chance to speak and, you know, which I, that's the process. And I'm glad, you sure. know, if, that they were able to do that. Senator figures did offer some amendments on the floor that I'd love to share with you. Um, one of them was that the first one she offered was everyone who passes this bill, who votes for this bill, you will be personally um, responsible to pay the legal bills that will come out of it. And of course, and she wanted a roll call vote on every one of the amendments she offered. So, of course, that one failed, of course, on party lines. Sure. And the next one was she wanted to make vasectomies a class C felony. <laughs> um, she felt that because it was going to be a crime for doctors to perform abortions, that she wanted to kind of get back and say the guys are going to have a problem. 
um, yeah, that, that was voted down. I, I've heard that argument before, and the truth is you don't hear it repeated all that often because it's even I think the pro-abortion activists realize how dumb it is um, because, <laughs> yeah. because the argument has never been. I mean, some of our Catholic friends may have some moral uh, apprehensions towards birth control, but the vast majority of the pro-life movement and, and even the Catholics that think that birth control is wrong still don't want to il- make it illegal, most of them. So nobody is arguing that, like, to try to be as professional as, as possible here. Um, a man's sperm is still his cells. And and a woman's right. egg is still her cells. The, the difference is once conception has happened, there is a completely unique genetic signature that has been has been created. And that's really the distinction. And so I think even the pro-abortion uh, abortion people realize that's a ridiculous argument. And that's the reason very few of them continue to use it. Yeah. Well, there was some laughing on the floor, of course, from both sides. And sure. the Democrats came right out and said, look, we know that this is going to pass tonight. We know you're going to get your way. So just allow us to, you know, make our points and say what we want to say. And so. Sure. And and they're elected officials. That's their prerogative. You know, they were kind of having fun with this one. Mm -hmm. Um, Then the the other one, she wanted to expand Medicaid. And that one was a failure as well. Later on in the debate, um, uh, Senator Singleton came up and he he did offer the rape and incest amendment again. And the vote was a little bit more than on party lines. We had four Republicans that did vote for it, which was Senator Del Marsh, who's the pro tem of the sentence. Um, let's see, Cam Ward, Senator McClendon, and Senator Jones, who is new this year. Those were all four Republicans that voted with the seven Democrats. What's Senator course, Jones' first failed. name? Because I'm not familiar with him. Um, Chris Jones. Chris I Jones is his name. Okay. Yes. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's Chris. Um, so then, you know, this all began around four o'clock. So by eight forty four, I think was the time they actually took the vote and it did pass. I do not have the numbers in front of me, but it was on party lines. And mm. there, so it, it passed by a great majority, of course. I was about to say, and, Republicans have a super-duper majority in the Senate, so yeah. that meant it, it passed pretty clearly. Yeah, it really did. Um, you know, when you were talking about, at the opening of your show, this being a real national phenomenon that's happening, and we're getting a lot of press, well, I had um, the BBC, I did an interview with them yesterday morning after mm-hmm. the vote, and of course they wanted to drag me into, well, how do you feel about the death penalty? And of course, I, I like it. And so, well, isn't that... You know, how can you be pro-life and so, you know, one's with a crime, with an adult making a choice. The other one is a, a living being that hasn't done anything wrong. And and then they wanted to bring in the Second Amendment and should should we limit guns or, you know, do you want everyone to have a gun? And so that was really fun, too. So, so a lot about, of red herring arguments, essentially. Yeah. So about an hour later, I got another call from someone from England with Good Morning Britain, which is like our Good Morning America. Mm-hmm. Um and they said, we just heard your interview. You want to come on our show on Monday morning? So I'm scheduled to go on and talk about this. Uh, it's 1 o'clock in the morning, our time, on Sunday night, but it'll be Monday. I mean, this this bill is really just making the whole world, I guess you could say, they're going apoplectic over this thing. And especially when you look at Hollywood and, and what they're saying and how we're all just backwards and which of course we're just trying to save a life here. Right. And, and I th- I think to- I think part of that may be the way that this thing has been pun intended build here is that we've uh-huh. said from the onset what the eventual goal is is to overturn Roe v. Wade. And so because of that and because they know that this may be, I guess, the the, the very first um the first breath of that, the first part of that movement, that's the reason that there's some international intrigue. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I guess maybe they recognize that, and that's the reason that they're paying close attention to it. Yeah, and I feel like America is, um, as a whole, as a country, we are much more pro-life, and we have that that Christian foundation, Mm -hmm. and still a lot of uh, evangelical country, you know, compared to all these other countries. And I think it's just really foreign to them to see these state legislatures coming out with these very strict 
abortion bills, and they're just having a hard time processing it, I think. Right, and if you grow up in a different culture, that's completely understandable. That's neither really a good or bad thing. It's just something that they're kind of surprised about. There are actually a few other countries, typically countries with a, a strong Catholic foundation, mm-hmm. a strong Catholic population. Uh, some South American countries, I believe... Um, Ireland, Ireland just recently voted to allow abortion, so they're actually moving in the other direction. But the point is, abortion was illegal there for a very long time. And so you do have a little bit of that in other places of the world. But yeah, especially America with the size and the the power that we have for there to be several jurisdictions in the state that are trying to severely limit abortion. I think that does bring some international intrigue. Mm hmm. Yeah. So. We'll see how this plays out. And I think, you know, there are other states, uh, we've had quite a few this year that have passed some heartbeat bills mm-hmm. and some, you know, Georgia just passed a bill. And, and I know there's some more that are working their way through their legislatures right now. Of course, ours is the most strict because of, for two reasons. One, um, it does not allow for any exceptions except the health of the mother. Mm-hmm. And also, it, as soon as the woman is known to be pregnant, she's not allowed to abort. A lot of these, it's a, when they have a heartbeat or you know, at 10 weeks or 20 weeks or whatever it is. But ours is pretty much as soon as you take that test and know you're pregnant, sorry, you're going to yeah, now, carry this baby. Now, Missouri's is interesting because theirs specifically deals with brain activity, which mm-hmm. maybe technology has gotten a lot better than I thought it was, but I thought it was very difficult to even detect brain activity in the child. Like we know about when it starts because we can see the development of the nervous tissue, but mm-hmm. uh, detecting brain activity, the neurons actually firing was, I thought, very difficult to do mm-hmm. because you're having to go through essentially two people instead of just one. And so maybe the technology's gotten a lot better, but people are very concerned about Missouri's law as well because mm-hmm. its standard isn't just heartbeat, it's specifically detectable brain activity. So mm-hmm. uh, you're right. There's a, what I like to see about this is that even though I like our build the best and maybe I'm a little biased just because I'm from Alabama, but I I mostly think it's because it, you know, the strictness of it. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're looking at it, I like the fact that there's a variety because it's one of those things that if you have several different arrows in the quiver, you have a better shot of one of them hitting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I agree. So was was that kind of the, how everything shook out? Was there anything else we need to know about, about the, I was kind of surprised, too. I ended up leaving at about seven. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of my colleagues was here, and she she spent the night at my house that night, and we we went ahead and left because we could listen on our phones on the way home. And so we listened in our cars on the way home and and finished watching it. They do stream from the Senate, so you could actually watch what was happening when when we got home. But as we walked out of the State House at about seven o'clock, there were demonstrations taking place on the front steps, you know, people with their bullhorns and their signs. Mm. And, and I would say uh, maybe a hundred or so people out front. And it's funny because on the inside, you, you don't really know what's happening outside. Um, a lot of times these rallies, you're just preaching to the crowd. So it was really just their people out there demonstrating, but it, it just kind of caught me off guard. I figured everyone would be inside watching and there wouldn't be anyone outside, but so there, I- there were. And then yesterday morning, there was a plane flying over the Capitol. Oh, I saw that. I don't know that. if you happen to see it, but yeah. Well, carrying, I didn't see uh, the plane. I saw pictures it. of the plane. Yeah, it carrying a sign saying abortion's okay, text such and such number. So that was kind of interesting, too. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that, too. Um, just real quickly, uh, when it came to that, what was the um, – the 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 breakup because you already said it was like ninety percent pro choice in the gallery. Were there pro life and pro choice protesters, or was it primarily just one side? You know, yeah, all all that I saw were were just the the pro choice protesters. I didn't see any pro lifers out there, but I wasn't right next to them. I walked out mm-hmm. the side door, but all the signs that I saw were abortion, Planned Parenthood kind of stuff. So and yeah, I I think all the pro lifers are just kind of meek and mild and wanted to be inside to watch what was happening. Well, Becky, I do greatly appreciate you coming on the program. I know I promised I'd get you off here by about 5.15, and we're already about five minutes past that. So thank you for being patient with us, and thank you for for calling in and sharing. You are so welcome. And actually, I think we will have a lot to talk about next week because we've got some bills that haven't moved yet this week, but they're on tap for next week. And I can update you on some immunization stuff going down. Excellent. We were able to kill the bill. Did, did we talk about this last week? Yes, we they, did. Uh, briefly, okay. because there weren't a lot of details, but we did mention yeah. it. Yeah. 
Was this the religious exemption one or was this the database? We talked about the religious exemption, and I think you right. mentioned the database when just sort of hinted at it. Can I take a second and just give you an update on that? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, with that, they were going to remove the religious exemption from anyone. So, so now, basically, if you want to go to school, your kid has to get immunized and you can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. The bill sponsor called me the next day and said, hey, I got to tell you about this bill, what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And so we had a great discussion, but he said as soon as he dropped that bill, within 12 hours, he was just getting hammered. And he said, "I we are pulling this bill. We are not going to do this. But he lives in a county that has a lot of illegals. And what's happening is these kids are coming in from other countries. They huh. go to the health department. They watch a five-minute video on immunizations. And then the, the people there tell them, well, you can just sign a religious exemption and you don't have to get immunized. And that's what they're uh -huh. doing. And so he said, we need to crack down on this somehow. And so we, we talked through some suggestions and some different policies that might be able to help but still retain our ability to exercise our freedom and be able to, you know, have those religious exemptions for the citizens of the state. Um, so more to come on that next year, but but people can rest easy that that, that is not going to happen mm. during this se this session. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. And, and you know, hopefully, I guess if that's not going to happen this session, this will be the end of it. But, uh, you know, I, I am interested to hear some of your thoughts on exactly are, are there any specific policies that you can think of that might be able to tighten up that loophole or, or close that? Yeah, there are. And so we can talk through some of that next week. And I will be working over the summer with some of these people and, and with sure. the sponsor of that bill specifically, because that's where the problem is. Mm. And, you know, see if we can come to to be able to solve this problem that but in a way that is still going to keep us free. <laughs> right. And that's the thing. It's, it's a difficult balance with a lot of different issues. You're trying to balance uh, making sure that you're protecting the rights of the people that want to use it for the right reason, while also not allowing people to get away with things that would abuse the system. And so uh, that, that, that is tricky. Honestly, I'm having a hard time coming up with a solution myself, but yeah. uh, we will talk about that next week. Thank you so much. Becky Gerritsen of Eagle Forum, Alabama. Always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. And people can always go to alabamaeagle.org for more information about Eagle Forum. And thank you so much, Caleb. All right. Thanks, Becky. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. All right. Once again, Becky Gerritsen of Eagle Forum, Alabama. We are going to take a quick break and we will be right back. And now for a reading from the Social Justice Warrior Bible with Pastor Gregory Post. Welcome in. I'm Gregory Post, head pastor at the Eternal Living Word Transdenominational Community Church and Coffee House in Novato, California. Now it's time for a reading from the SJW Bible. Today's reading will come from Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting the fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And the fire came out of the presence of the Lord, which created a wicked cool light show for them to see and totally got everyone feeling the Spirit's presence. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke, saying, Even though I didn't command you to use this strange fire, I totally understand your need to express yourselves in worship and keep yourselves entertained. So Aaron therefore danced and yelled with joy, knowing that his sons were having a good time at worship. Moses called out to Mishael and Ezaphan, and the son of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Come forward, carry your relatives away in front of the sanctuary outside of the camp for they have fainted from being overwhelmed by the power of God's coolness. So they came forward and carried them still in their tunics outside the camp, as Moses had said. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, because God wants us to always be happy, and as long as we're happy, he's happy. Therefore, if worship doesn't give you an overwhelming sense of euphoria, you need to find another congregation, preferably one with a more dynamic pastor and band. So they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you, when you come into the sanctuary, so that you will be able to drink more once you arrive. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. 
and so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, between the unclean and the clean, because when worship stops being fun or feels judgy, then it becomes profane and unclean. Wow, so inspiring. This has been a reading from the SJW Bible, and remember, the only truth that matters is your truth. And welcome back. I think we had a little technical glitch there that paused the broadcast for a second. Not sure exactly why that took place, but nonetheless, we do very much appreciate you staying with us throughout the break and throughout our little technical snafu there. So, of course, the abortion ban in the state of Alabama is probably, I mean, there's really no doubt about it. It is the biggest news story that there is right now, but there's a couple things that I, I really wanted to bring up here. First of all, there's been somewhat of a rift between even people in the conservative movement, and it kind of mirrors a rift that happened in the Republican Party right before the abolition of slavery. Because as you may recall, the Republican Party back in the mid-1800s was founded on two principles. We want to get rid of slavery. We want to get rid of polygamy. Apparently they were very successful in that because we pretty much outlawed polygamy and completely outlawed slavery with the constitutional amendment. So you got to give the early Republican Party credit. They accomplished their two big goals, the two things that they were founded on. But nonetheless, there is a similar rift that is going on between the Republicans then and now because what you had is you had two different camps on slavery within the Republican Party. There were the absolutionist when it came to abolition, and you had the incrementalist. So to explain exactly what's going on here with that, that there were people that believed, let's just, it doesn't matter what we have to do, even if we have to go to war with half the country, we need to go ahead and get rid of slavery right now. Just done. We make it a law. We force the other states not to engage in slavery. It's an immoral, evil practice that we must get rid of right this second. This was a correct interpretation, of course. It was morally correct, and it was legally correct. Had I existed in the time of slavery, I would have fallen more into that camp. I would have been one of the, let's go ahead, get rid of slavery right now, let's not deal with this. And part of the argument, actually, is because the founders, which the vast majority of them were actually anti-slavery, they tried the incremental approach, and it didn't work. That's why the Constitution has within it a 20-year period to phase out the slave trade. The founders, many of them were abolitionists when it came, came to slavery. There were a few that were, let's get rid of slavery right now. There were a couple that wanted to do it kind of incrementally to mitigate the shock economically and, and in other societal ways from ending it right away without any warning. And so they just sort of wanted to gradually over time get rid of slavery, and that's why that provision is enshrined in the Constitution. That obviously didn't work. And that's the reason that I thought incrementalism was a bad idea, and eventually history did show that wanting to go ahead and getting rid of slavery right then and there with the Emancipation Proclamation, which didn't really work right away and didn't eliminate slavery in all the states, but that laid the groundwork for the 13th Amendment. And then slavery was just done. That was the better approach, and history shows that. There's a similar rift with abortion. There are two camps here. There are There's the camp of people saying we need to go ahead and get rid of abortion. Let's go for broke, swing for the fences. Let's go ahead and get rid of it. That's the camp I tend to find myself in far more often than not. And if I had to guess, that is the camp that the vast majority of conservatives in America find themselves in. Then you have the incrementalist, the people that say abortion is really bad. It's a horrible thing, and we want to get rid of it as soon as possible too, but we don't believe that that is going to happen, at least not overnight, and so it's better to take smaller baby steps towards getting rid of abortion. Now, this is an approach that I do not necessarily agree with. I think that like slavery, it will prove to be better to go ahead and just cut the head off right away, go for broke and swing for the fences to get rid of this establishment. 
However, I do think that it is wise to not just rah-rah, high-five each other when something like this happens, and then ignore the overall fight and how we're actually going to implement it. Because if all you're doing is making good arguments, if all you're doing is passing laws that get struck down by the court and you never move anywhere past that. And I don't think that they're, I think even the people that passed this bill did it specifically because they knew it was going to face scrutiny by the Supreme court. And that was the plan from the beginning. You've seen that on this show a number of times, but what I'm saying here is there are people that, that tend to take the slow approach that would rather, okay, well, let's just go ahead and ban it after this period of time, and then a few years later we'll move up to banning it at this period of time. I don't agree with that method because it undermines the core moral principle of the abortion movement, or the anti-abortion movement, which is, of course, that abortion itself is a moral evil. And if there is a practice that is being done that is a moral evil, you don't make compromises with that evil. You could use this with slavery, or you could use it with something that's not a, as big a moral evil, or at least not societally. For example, if you have somebody that is a friend of yours, and you know that person is prone to lying, you don't tell them, okay, well, what you need to do is you need to just back off on lying. Try to just tell, if you usually tell 10 lies a day, try to just do eight lies tomorrow, and then the next week we'll try to work you down to six, and the next, that approach isn't going to work. You have to impress upon people the urgency, and you also have to impress upon people the fact that this is a moral evil, and it's something that you need to get out of your life. Now, in practical practice, what is going to happen is somebody that struggles with the sin of lying or alcoholism or whatever else, because sins do become habits and moral evils do become habits, that person is going to eventually incrementally get rid of it if they do get rid of it. That's just the way that it works. That's the way human beings operate. I understand that, but I'm saying the vigor and the way that the message has to be framed in order to motivate them to continue that incremental process of sanctifying themselves and getting rid of the sin of their life is to impress upon them the importance and the abhorrence of their own sin. And so this is the same thing with abortion. You don't have to use the word sin because, of course, we're talking in legal terms here. But if abortion is a moral evil and it is something that perverts the promise at the core of our country, which is to preserve first and foremost life and then liberty and the pursuit of happiness, if that is the core principle of our country and what is going on now, abortion, which is at odds with that, we have to impress upon people that that is something that needs to be gotten rid of immediately. Now, is it going to be gotten rid of immediately? No. I would love for tomorrow the House and the Senate and the President and the states go through the process of putting up a constitutional amendment to preserve life from the moment of conception to the moment of death, that person is considered a person and they have the full rights and protections as anybody else. I would love for that to happen, but I realize that's not going to happen. But advocating for that position more strongly pulls people in that direction. It impresses upon them the urgency of it. And that's exactly the fight that we've been having here in the state of Alabama. The reason that we said that this needs to be a clean bill with no exceptions is because suggesting that, okay, killing a child is a moral evil and this thing is aimed at preserving life. Well, except, of course, when there's rape or incest involved. And then, even though it is a life, we can just go ahead and off it. Well, that undermines the core principle underlying your argument. If your core argument is this is a person, then anything else that degrades that undermines the purpose of the bill itself. And so it does take, in my opinion, a strong stance that this is a moral evil to start that incremental process of getting rid of it. I understand that it's not going to be gotten rid of overnight. I wish that it would be, but it's not. I understand that, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop advocating for it being gotten rid of overnight. That doesn't mean I'm going to back off on my rhetoric for the same reason that the abolitionist movement, when it came to slavery, didn't do that. And there were people that were incrementalists when it came to slavery, even in the 1800s. 
Robert E. Lee, for example, he was an abolitionist. He believed that it should have been gotten rid of gradually, and he actually believed that when the Civil War was over, the states individually over time would do that themselves, including in the Confederacy. Abraham Lincoln actually took this stance. He was not an immediate abolitionist. He was a incremental abolitionist. Frederick Douglass took the opposite side, and that was really the contrast between the two of them when they went up against each other to be senator. They had this debate over and over again. This is all well documented. I encourage you to read them. But what's going on here is really, and I want to take a look at the, the larger worldview because I think it, it might help us understand one another a little bit better. There is a distinction between someone who is an idealist and a pragmatist. I am an idealist. Always have been. I think anybody that has been watching my show for any amount of time realizes that I, I talk about the world as it ought to be. I also talk about it as it is, but primarily I'm focused on what the world is supposed to be. And I try to operate under that. There are a lot of people that don't do that. It's not because they're morally incorrect. On this issue it may, it may be, but I'm talking about as a general rule. Taking abortion out of it for a second. There are people that are more pragmatic. They want to take practical approaches. They try to look at the world and see, okay, what can we do right now? Both the pro-life movement, the conservative movement as a whole, and the human race needs these people. You have to have a blend of both. I firmly believe that. Even though I get annoyed with it sometimes, I get annoyed with pragmatists. Part of the reason yesterday when this bill passed, I had Matt Clark on. I mean, part of it is just because he's a smart guy and very insightful and knows the law a lot better than me. Yes, those are all contributing factors. That One of the main reasons that I got him on as opposed to another attorney is because I understand how he thinks. I understand that he's much more of a pragmatist than I am. It's not a bad thing. I realize that the world needs both. Now, that doesn't mean that Matt isn't 100% for getting rid of abortion right now. If, if he had a, a magic button that he could press that tomorrow all abortion would be illegal in the United States or in the world, he would certainly do it. I know him. But I'm just saying that the reason I brought him on is specifically I'm more worried about the philosophical side of it. He's more worried with the practical side of it and the law and whether or not the law is actually going to overturn Roe v. Wade. That's the reason I wanted his perspective on the show. I realize that he's much more of a pragmatist than I am. You've heard on this program before, my buddy Chris, who comes on sometimes with the nerd herd, doesn't get into the politics quite as much as some of the other guests. But he and I have often joked, and, and, he, and he and I are best friends, uh, he and I have often joked that the only difference between the two of us is that even though we think virtually the same thing on most issues and, and our brains run on parallel tracks, they're not the same track, but they're parallel tracks. We think in the same way. The only difference is he's very pragmatic. I'm very idealistic. And it's really funny to watch us talk about issues, as you've probably seen before, if you've been listening to the show when, when we, he's on the program You'll realize how entertaining that is because he's he's the ultimate pragmatist. I'm the ultimate idealist. And so it's interesting. But my point is the human race as a whole, we as people need to have both. And some people tend to fall more in the middle. I'm kind of an extreme idealist. I know a lot of people that are extreme pragmatists. The reason the human race needs both, the reason that we have to have both of those forces pulling in the correct direction is because when you have both, Goals actually get accomplished. You need the idealist like me. And you need the pragmatist. You need the pragmatist because if it were just a bunch of idealists, we'd never get anything done. We would sit around talking about what needs to be done and nothing would ever actually get done. But see, the pragmatist also needs the idealist. Because they give them an idea of what they ought to be working toward. And we motivate them to do that. If you think about it, since we're in the state of Alabama, this will, will work really well. If you think about it like a football team, a coach needs to have two different skills. He needs to know the game and he needs to be good at co coming up with a strategy to combat whatever strategy the other team is going to impose on him. Sure, that's a, a big part of coaching. I would even argue the bigger part of coaching. That's the pragmatic part. 
but you have to have either him or somebody else on the staff that gets the players ready, that gets them pumped up, that makes them believe that they can win every game. Even if they can't actually win every game, they need to believe that they can win every single game because it will cause them to play better. We, we've seen it time and time again as sports fans. You can have the best strategy in the world. You can have the best talent in the world. And if that team is not clicking and they're, they're not meshing together, the teamwork and the chemistry is not there, and they don't believe that they can win a game, it's not going to matter. And so that's why in any political movement or really any aspect of life, you have to have both elements present. You got to have the pragmatist and you have to have the idealist. I'm happy to fulfill that idealist role. And I'm also happy to associate with people that have a more pragmatic approach to it. So that being said, since most of the show today has been about abortion, I thought that in the aftermath of this, you're probably having a lot of discussions about this particular topic. And so I thought what I would do is just something a little bit special here, and, and I don't know how long it'll take, but it, it really shouldn't take too long. We'll probably try to zip through this. I thought about you're, you're seeing basically every stupid, bad abortion, pro-abortion argument that is in the book being hurled at you. And there are some arguments that, while they're not necessarily good or they don't necessarily, I think, necessitate the conclusion that abortion should be legal, I think that there's at least some teeth to them. But what I wanted to share with you today is essentially the five worst ones that are easiest to overturn. When it comes to things like bodily agency, for example, I do think that there's at least a, a kernel of truth underlying that, and so it is something that you, you have to deal more with on a uh, a philosophical level, but these are really just the five really bad arguments that really ought to be, it, it's so easy to overturn these if you get into this discussion, and I'm going to go through each one and show you how to do that. I saw one the other day, and this is going to be number five. I saw one the other day that it is a, as many of these are, pure, raw, emotional appeals with no sense of logic undergirding it whatsoever. And it is, think about the women in your life. Think about the women in your life, and I want you to really think about them, and, and because of that, you should be supporting abortion. Yeah, I, I don't see how, but let's break down their argument, because I, I do understand where they're coming from, at least in this sense. They're saying that women are going to have to have give birth and, and all this other stuff, which, first of all, doesn't sound like the most terrible thing in the world. Most of the women in my life have given birth at least at some point, including my mom. Oddly enough, but my point here is the the insinuation is that you don't care about women if you're for restricting abortion, that you don't care about women. You don't have sufficient compassion for women if you are in favor of this. And there's a couple of reasons why this is really, really stupid. First of all the first and foremost one would be that there is not a significant distinction between the sexes when it comes to whether or not they're in favor of abortion. See, it's all derived from this idea that there's a bunch of evil white men. I don't know why they're white, and I don't know why that's important, but that's the insinuation. that There's a bunch of evil white men that are sort of sitting in these smoke-filled rooms trying to figure out ways to oppress women. And one of the primary ways that they do that is evoking abortion. I'm sorry, that's not true. They, they try to paint up this picture that the only people that are actually doing this, the only people that are actually in favor of abortion are men. Except that's not true, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. I do think about the women in my life. There are women, I'm not going to say who, because I've been sworn to secrecy, there are women in my life, very close to me, who have had rape occur to them, did not get impregnated because of it, but these same women have told me that if it had been, if, if there had been a pregnancy that occurred, they would have gone through with the pregnancy. And I have no reason to disbelieve them in that. And another thing, too, there are... There's one woman I'm specifically thinking about. 
She's not quite a woman yet. She's pretty young. But there is a young lady in my life, a member of my family, that had every single thing pulling against her for her to still be alive today. And I don't want to get into too many details because I don't want to give away who this is, but I have a family member who was in a position that they had no way economically to support this child. Both he and the young lady that he impregnated were underage. I mean, if you were ever to look at a textbook case of where an elective abortion would be, quote unquote, useful, it would be this one. It would absolutely be this one because they had no financial means of support. And yet, even though they actually tend to vote Democrat, at least their family did at the time, they didn't vote because they were underage, obviously. They decided to keep the child. And that little lady is a ball of energy. She's a gorgeous little girl. And the circumstances surrounding her conception were far from ideal. But that doesn't make her any less of a person. That doesn't degrade her life in any way. And the thought of her not being there when my family sits down to Thanksgiving dinner or gets together at Christmas is unconscionable to me. Luckily, in her case, her parents decided not to abort her. But the thought that they could have that they could have made that decision, that they, even though I'm, I'm thrilled that they didn't, that they would have had every excuse in the eyes of the left to decide to terminate their own child, to kill their own daughter. They chose not to, and she has been a wonderful blessing in their life, and the life of a lot of other people, including myself. So when you hear them say that, well, you need to think about the women, I do think about the women. And the story that I just shared you with specifically, one young lady in my life, and she's about, I think, five or six now. If I ever think about the women in my life, that's the reason that I'm against abortion. All right, number four on the list. Well, if this happens, this is going to turn us into the handmaid's tale. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, and I really don't know why you would be familiar with it because it's something that I really couldn't get into, but there is a, it's a series, it's a series that's based on a book of this post-apocalyptic future, but instead of people riding around in makeshift cars and shooting one another like Mad Max or, you know, living in the Terminator future, there is this future where the government's been abolished and women are essentially just used as incubators for children. And they, uh, they're subject to sex slavery, and they're subject to all these other things. And they're saying, well, this is going to be the handmaid's tale where women are just property of men, and they just use them to breed sons and daughters for them. First of all, there's a, a massive logical leap you have to to try to bridge to get there. Secondly, I will say that I do appreciate the handmaid's tell, at least in this instance. If you've seen the protesters that are out in front of Alabama's uh, capital these past few days, while this fight was going on and seen the protesters that are dressed in garb of the handmaid's tell in front of the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, I greatly appreciate their fashion choices because usually when you see a bunch of pro-abortion protesters, they're wearing practically nothing. And let's be honest, even though it's immoral for anybody to be dressed provocatively like that in, in public, a lot of these women are not people that would even be appealing to view <laughs> in this state. And so the fact that they're wearing basically head to toe body covering, they're dressed like a Puritan, I think is a huge win culturally because we don't have to see them half naked or worse than half naked in these circumstances. So that I am very grateful to the hand, hand the handmaid's tale for, if nothing else. But first of all, this is basically the definition of a slippery slope argument. The idea that you think because abortion would no longer be legal to you, 
that this is going to be something that devolves into a post-apocalyptic world where women have no rights and are viewed as property makes no sense. And second of all, when you're looking at the uh, the idea that the Handmaid's Tale is is somehow a precursor to this, the insinuation here is, well, you're really trying to control a woman's body. No, no. And in fact, there are a lot of parts of women's body that men would love to control. Like if you gave especially sleazy men a remote control and get, you're like, you can control a woman. I guarantee you the last part of the woman they would try to figure out, can I control this would be the uterus. That, that That's really low on the list of things that men want to control about women. In fact, even if you're talking about the most uh, sexist, misogynistic man on earth, even on his list of things that he would want to control about women, uterus has got to be down there with like lungs. And I mean, just there, there's no, that, that's not an appealing part of a woman's body, even to the sleaziest, most perverse guy. Which, by the way, brings me to a second point. This insinuation that uh, real men are ones that support a woman's ability to choose to murder her child. This is the exact opposite of true. Because if you look at the men that support abortion, who are they typically? They are ones that want to have sex with women with no consequences. A real man is one that, of course, wants to have sex with women, but he understands that there is a responsibility that is coupled with that. Now, of course, the Christian ideal and the way that it should be is through the vows of marriage. In other words, you take a commitment to a woman and you say, whatever happens to you or whatever happens to any children you bear, I take responsibility for that. I will take care of you. I will take care of our family. That's what marriage is supposed to do. But ironically, the left, who has tried to decouple sex from not only marriage, but any form of commitment whatsoever, this is part of that overall plan. They're trying to make it to where you can have sex with impunity with anybody you want and there are no consequences for it. That is ultimately what they desire. And this is why that whole debate between rape and incest and whether or not that was going to be included in the bill, nine times out of ten, all you have to do is ask, okay, well, are you for outlawing all abortion that wouldn't fall within those confines? Nine times out of ten, they'll say no. And then you say, well, then why did you even bring it up? If your goal is abortion on demand, abortion at any point in the pregnancy, then why would you go so far as to bring up rape or incest in the first place? It's an it's a dishonest way to have the argument to try to take an exception to the rule, in this case, an extremely small percentage of the rule, and try to use that to justify the entire thing. But nonetheless, getting back to the overall point here of men controlling women's bodies, it's the sleazebag men that want to have sex with as many women as they possibly can and not suffer any consequences, not have to pay child support or not support that woman or support the child in any way, the one that just wants to have sex without responsibility, those are the men that support abortion. It's the men that respect women, who value women, and think that sex ought to be coupled with some kind of responsibility. Those are the men that you want to marry. Those are the men that actually do what men are supposed to do, which is act as caretakers and protectors of women. The ones that are for abortion, they're just the ones that want to use women. And I know that this is gross, and I know that this is a family show, so I'm going to say this as politely as possible, but it's the truth. That basically want to use women as nothing more than a device to pleasure themselves with. That see them just as sexual objects and nothing more. Those are the men that are in favor of abortion. The ones that are against it are the ones that are willing to take actual responsibility for the children that they might, may produce. And the reason that a lot of those men, a large percentage of them, believe that marriage and commitment should be part and parcel of sexual intercourse with a woman. Those are the men that you actually want to marry. Those are the, women that, the men that women ought to desire. The men that you're talking about that, that like women that are in favor of abortion, those are the men that want to use women to their own ends. And so the whole handmaid's tale thing, it's actually the exact opposite. The men that want to use women for their own sexual pleasure, they're the ones that are pro-choice. All right, number three on the list. 
They say, get your God out of my uterus. Religion shouldn't be used as something that is a basis for policy. There is an aspect of this argument that I actually think is true. And before you start throwing uh, bottles at your computer screen, give me a second to explain. It is true that something being a part of a religion is not in and of itself a reason to make something legal or illegal. For example, adultery is completely against the laws of God. It is a sexual sin. However, as gross and disgusting as adultery is, it is a consensual sexual relationship, unless we're talking about rape, and that's a completely different thing. But it's a consensual relationship between two adults that even though it's morally reprehensible, they're not creating a victim in the strictest sense. And so I don't understand why that should be something that's illegal. Lying, for example. Lying's a terrible thing. Anybody that's watched this program for, for any amount of time understands how much I revere the truth. But lying still shouldn't be a sin. Then you run into a, a constitutional issue about free speech. If you want to lie, you should be allowed to lie. There should not be any legal penalty for lying, unless, of course, you're lying in a way that, again, creates some kind of victim, like if you're falsifying a police report, something like that. And even then, that's not the speech itself that's being prosecuted. But something being a religious tenet is not necessarily grounds, or it should not be automatically, okay, well, if, if that's what the Bible says, then we've got to make a law against it. If the Bible says this is wrong, then we need to criminalize it. I don't believe that that's a correct approach to take, and our founders didn't believe that either. However, just saying that because a religion says something that we ought to do the opposite and say that that shouldn't be a law, that's also not a valid argument. Case in point, theft is something that the Bible says is wrong. Should we decriminalize theft just because the Bible says that it's wrong? Because you could use that same argument and say, well, get your God out of my, I don't know, thieving ability. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you're saying that if you're going to use that argument, you can't use that argument to say, well, a religion teaches that it's wrong, ergo we should disregard it. Well, then you're going to have murder and rape and all kinds of other things made legal if you're saying, well, if a religion says it's wrong, then we need to make it legal. See, they're trying to do the opposite here. I don't think that something merely being in the Bible is a grounds in and of itself for making something illegal. But it's also not grounds to make bad things that the religion teaches against legal either. Furthermore, and this is the second part of this, when it comes to religion, I don't need religion to get to the point where abortion is wrong. I don't. I do not need religion to get to that point. Someone merely needs a basic understanding of biology I mean very rudimentary, elementary level, to understand that the baby growing inside a woman is indeed a baby. That's all you need. You don't need a religious argument. The Bible certainly teaches that it's wrong, but you don't need a religious basis to get there. Austin Peterson, for example, guy ran for president, was a member of the Libertarian Party. Guy's an atheist, still pro-life. You see, by any objective scientific measure, the child growing inside a woman is indeed a human being. And so if you hold the belief that that life, a human life, is intrinsically valuable, then you arrive at the fact that abortion then should be illegal. For the same reason that killing a two-year-old or killing a five-year-old or killing a 30-year-old is wrong, killing the baby inside the woman is also wrong. You don't need religion to reach that. You don't. The left constantly tries to paint it as though the only, the only way that you can arrive at abortion is an incorrect or immoral action is if you're using the Bible, and the Bible just has a bunch of arbitrary rules that God just sort of on a whim said, okay, well, that's wrong. But no, it's not arbitrary. There is a good reason for it, and you don't even need the Bible to reach that conclusion. You certainly can reach that conclusion through the Bible. But that's not the only thing at play here. Even if I became an atheist tomorrow, I would not suddenly be pro-choice. Now, there is an aspect of religion that is needed to reach 
at least part of that argument, and that is that life is intrinsically valuable. You do need religion to get to that point because if we're just meat bags riding on a rock through space, well, then our lives are not terribly significant. We have no purpose. We have no meaning. But as far as the idea that life is intrinsically valued, if you, if you believe that human life, that there is some value to that, then if you are to follow logic correctly, you will arrive at abortion being illegal, that abortion being criminalized. So, yes, it's, it's true that you don't need religion to get there because as long as you accept that premise, you don't have to accept religion or you don't have to accept the Bible. As long as you accept the premise merely, even though that premise does have religious roots, that human life is valuable and it is intrinsically valuable. For Christians, the reason that we believe that is because each human being is created in God's image and the same for the Jews. But if you can reach that through some other means, as long as you value human life in some way, then you cannot consistently say, but I also think abortion is not wrong. And those two worldviews are, are completely incompatible. All right, number two, the baby is not a human. We've already touched on this one slightly. There is no definition that a liberal can give of a human being that would not include an unborn child in it. Now, they can sometimes give you a definition that would exclude the unborn, but you would also have to exclude some other group in that which everybody would agree is human. And so anytime they give you a definition, this is what I always do. If somebody makes the claim that a child is not a human, a child living in the womb is not a human, just ask them to define humanity. And if they do, I guarantee you nine times out of ten you, ten, you could apply that same definition to somebody outside of the womb. And a, a great example the other day, got into this discussion with somebody. They said, well, the thing is, they gave me a definition and they said it has to be somebody that is capable of speech and walking uprightly. So people with uh, people that, that have a hunch, people that are hunched over when they walk, those people aren't people. People that can't speak aren't people. So if you've had your tongue cut out or if you just have some kind of mutism or if you're, you're deaf and you can make sounds but you can't actually form words if you were born deaf, for example, that makes you not human. See, they, they can't come up with a definition that would exclude the unborn that also doesn't exclude somebody that everyone would agree is a human. If you have homo sapien DNA, if your DNA is a unique genetic signature and you have that DNA residing within you, then you are indeed a human being. Anybody that says differently is being blatantly and intentionally anti-science. There's just no way around that. And finally... This may be one of my favorites. They say, no uterus, no opinion. In other words, if you don't have a uterus, if you don't have a female body, then you don't get to, you, you don't get to have an opinion on the issue of abortion. There's a number of reasons why this is a really terrible example. First of all, it's one of the laziest debate tactics in any, this isn't even exclusive to abortion. This intersectionality nonsense that has run rampant through the Democrat Party is one of the laziest debate tactics I've ever seen because what they're trying to do is they're trying to whittle down the pool of people who are allowed to even comment and they disregard your comment if you don't fit into that particular class of people. The quickest way to end this argument is to just say, okay, well, I guess Abraham Lincoln should not have spoken about slavery because that was an issue that affected black people. Well, if you... And if they say, well, no, 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 that was different because slavery was wrong. Okay, so what you're saying is only the only thing that matters in this debate, the only people that get to express an opinion in this debate are people that agree with me. In fact, that was what was happening on Twitter. You had, it was funny, there was almost a division between the pro-choice movement. There were people that saying men aren't allowed to comment on this. And then there were other women saying that men ought to comment on this and they ought to stand up with women for our reproductive rights. And so there's no consistency on the left whatsoever. They're saying men shouldn't comment, men should comment, and, and there's really no consistency on that whatsoever. But nonetheless, 
it is a lazy, lazy debate tactic to try to exclude all the opinions that you don't want. In other words, well, if you disagree with me, then your opinion doesn't matter. You could say that about any issue, and it's just your way of being dismissive of arguments which you find to be incorrect without actually having to fight the argument. They're trying to shut you up as opposed to actually winning the fight, winning the debate. It would kind of like be if I were pitching and well, we won't use Bryce Harper because he's kind of dying on the vine right now in Philadelphia. But if, if I were the starting pitcher and that's a scary thought because I can't pitch, but if I were the pitcher and you had a, a different player, you know, uh, we'll, we'll use a brave since we're the home of the braves. Let's say uh Inter Inciarte steps up and I'm got like, uh, I'm not pitching to him. I, I want, I want you to go, you know, he's not a valid player. He needs to go away. I don't accept that he is allowed to bat in this lineup. Well, at that point, you can tell it's not that I want to actually win the game. It's not that I actually want to beat him. I don't want to have to compete against him. And that's what's going on in this thing. What is going on here is that you have people that realize that they can't win the argument or rather would not like to engage in the discussion. And so they're trying to silence the voice of anybody that disagrees with them. And it's very convenient that you're knocking out half the population and you're saying half the population isn't allowed to have an opinion on this. But another thing that is important here is that it also operates off the premise that women are pro-abortion or men are against abortion. And it's because men are trying to control women through the patriarchy. The problem is the numbers do not bear that out. According to a Pew Research poll, which was taken back in December of 2018, men and women don't differ very much on their opinions of abortion. There's a little difference, but not much. In fact, there were 58% of men that agreed that abortion should be legal in most cases. 60% of women said the same thing. That's in the U.S. But if you look at it worldwide, in the vast majority of countries, the differentiation is even smaller. There's just simply... Without, you know, whether or not you look at it, how popular or non-popular it is in some countries, there's very little breathing room between men and women on whether or not they think it should be legal or illegal. And so trying to frame it in such a way that they're trying to say, well, only men are for this and therefore men's opinion shouldn't matter. Only women should matter. And if you're saying that it just doesn't make any sense because there's not a lot of breathing room if you're looking at the whole picture between men and women anyway. The USA Today did the same thing in Huffington Post, followed suit. They said 25 white men, white senators, are the ones from Alabama that passed this bill. Well, yes, but you're completely ignoring the fact that Terry Collins is the sponsor of the bill who's been on this program before. She's the one that brought the bill up in the first place in the House. She's a lady. There were other female representatives in the state house that voted in favor of this. And the governor that signed it into law yesterday, Kay Ivey, is a woman. And so they, they try to paint this picture. It's a bunch of men deciding things for women. No. There are just as many women that are in favor of this bill as men. It just so happened that in the Senate, which is predominantly male on both sides of the aisle, that the only ones that voted in favor of it were men. But in the House, there were several women that voted for it. If you were to take a survey of how people of Alabama feel about abortion, you're going to get very little breathing room between men and women as who finds it favorable and who doesn't. And that is true across not only the U.S., that's true across every country as Pew Research found. So they're trying to frame the argument in such a way, but it really just does not work because when they're trying to do this, it, it falls apart as soon as you look at the numbers and the approval numbers of abortion between men and women. And furthermore, what they're trying to craft it in such a way, and this is so important when you're in a debate, you always want to take their ideas kind of out for a test drive and apply it to a different situation and see, does this rationale really hold? Would this work in another situation if the parameters were pretty similar? So essentially the assertion is, if you are incapable of getting pregnant, if you're incapable of giving birth, if you cannot be directly affected 
by abortion, then you shouldn't be able to have a say in it. Well, what about lesbians? Do lesbians not get a say on abortion because they're not really in a position where they're very likely to get pregnant? What about girls that have not quite reached the age where they can conceive? What about women that are barren? What about women that have already gone through menopause and can't get pregnant again? Do their opinions, are they now null and void because they can't be directly affected by the issue? I have a friend that went through chemotherapy. She's a cancer survivor just like me, and she can't have children anymore. That's a side effect of chemotherapy. In fact, I honestly don't even know if, if I've been affected by that or not. I, I haven't been tested for that. Uh, I assume that it didn't, didn't happen to me, but it could have. This is something that women that go through chemotherapy have to worry about. They have to worry about being sterilized as a side effect of those drugs. Do those women no longer have an opinion on abortion? Are they now disqualified from having that opinion? You see, when you take that logic out for a test drive, you can see very clearly that applied to virtually any other situation how fast that falls apart. Apply it to something that isn't directly related to abortion. Let's say child abuse. Well, I'm not a parent, and I don't have any children, and I'm no longer a child myself. I'm, I'm 29 years old now. Does that mean I'm no longer qualified to speak on the issue of child abuse? Or child molestation? I can't be a victim of that crime. Does that mean I'm no longer allowed to talk on that? You see, there's absolutely no world where this makes any sense whatsoever. All right, so that being said, we're going to go ahead and go to the daily, the daily dose of stupid. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. <laughs> the daily dose of stupid today, I got to say, I am kind of ashamed of myself that I missed this one. Apparently, this happened over the weekend, and I just now heard about it. Did you know that Beto O'Rourke, Bob Francis O'Rourke, the most Hispanic Irishman that we have in the race, which is actually the same as saying he's the least Hispanic Irishman in the race, but Bob O'Rourke had to take a break from his campaign. Skater boy Bob O'Rourke was not on the campaign trail this weekend because of all things, he had a family emergency. And the family emergency was he lost his turtle. Now, I understand losing a dog. Dogs tend to wander. They can chase a car, get lost. I, I understand losing a cat. I understand losing a number of different animals. I am the guy who ran through a subdivision chasing a couple of, of show steers that I had one time. Like I, I get losing animals. This is not a new phenomenon to me. But it's a turtle. They're the slowest creature on earth, and somehow Bob Francis O'Rourke's family <laughs> lost the turtle. Now, I I'm glad that his family found the turtle. I don't wish any ill towards him. I'm just sitting here thinking, this man can't keep tabs on a turtle. It's not like a dog where you could turn around and then all of a sudden the thing's just gone. I mean, how does a turtle run away from home? How does a turtle get lost in the first place? It's a turtle. I mean, I, I just don't get that. This guy can't keep tabs on a turtle, and we think that he might be qualified to be the leader of the free world? I don't know. That just strikes me as odd. I'm glad that Gus O'Rourke, Gus the Turtle, is back, and... Uh, <laughs> I just, I'm sorry, I just keep picturing Bob O'Rourke, skater boy Bob O'Rourke going like, dude, I've like lost my turtle and stuff. Gotta go back home and like look for him. I don't know, that's just how I... <laughs> I don't know, maybe the turtle has the same personality and so the, the turtle's like turtle version of Bob O'Rourke and the turtle's just looking back at him going, dude, I was like... So lost and afraid and stuff. I'm so glad you guys found me. I don't. <laughs> I don't. Th I don't think everybody in the O'Rourke family is a skater person. But 
I don't know. Someone needs to make that YouTube video of, of Bob O'Rourke and his turtle conversing in that way. <laughs> All right, let's go on and, and get serious here. Let's go to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. We are going to continue our look through the book of Daniel. And as you may recall, we've already gone through this episode where King Darius and, and Daniel uh, have this, they have a mutual respect for one another. King Darius really likes Daniel. He's going to put him in a high position in his kingdom. And because of this, the princes and satraps, the officials that are vying for that job, they want to eliminate Daniel because he's the biggest threat to them having more power. And so eventually they get him thrown into the lion's den for praying. They get him thrown into the lion's den because of his faith, because they couldn't figure out any way to make him look bad. And so they attack the only thing that they could think of, which was, of course, Daniel's very strong faith and reliance upon God. And he's been put through the lion's den. Darius was very distressed about this. And the next morning, out comes Daniel, perfectly okay. And we're going to see sort of the conclusion of that story in this next part. This comes from Daniel 6, 23 through 24. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The king then gave orders and they brought those men who had miraculously accused or maliciously accused Daniel and they uh, they cast them, their children and their wives, into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Well, first of all, I think this does kind of show the brutality of the Mede and Persian Empire. I mean, you don't just throw the guys that were evil, the guys that were that essentially duped the king into putting Daniel in a situation where he had to choose between praying and obeying the law. They threw their wives and their children in there. So, you know, in no way is the Medes and Persians a representative of God's divine will or his judgment. But it does show you the brutality and the anger of this pagan king, King Darius. But in, in Daniel's position and the way that he comes out, I love the description there that he came out with no injury whatsoever. So we're seeing something very similar to what we saw earlier in the book of Daniel, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told that they would worship this idol or they would be cast into the fire. And the way it describes them is they came out not even smelling like smoke. It is as if, if the fire had never touched them. And Daniel is in the same position. He's thrown into the lion's den, and he doesn't have any injury, not so much as a scratch. And yet when they throw these people in, it says that they had not even reached the den floor before these hungry lions had consumed them and broken their bones. So there's a definite message here and a definite contrast between the two. The contrast that is intentionally being shown and portrayed and, and put sort of center stage here is that because Daniel trusted in God, God sent his angel to close up the lion's mouth. These other people that trusted in their pagan gods and tried to destroy Daniel, a good man that had done them no harm whatsoever, had never done anything to undermine them or injure them in some way, they went after Daniel just because they wanted to amass their own power, to enrich themselves. The focus was on them, and they were only concerned with doing what they wanted, not with what was right, not with what was good. They were concerned with how do I get mine? It was as self-centered a motivation as a human being can possibly get. And they reap the rewards of their actions. Sadly, 
and we're not given a lot of information on exactly how this took place, the sort of indication is that it happened virtually immediately, is that they and, unfortunately, their families also paid the price for their own envy. It really is a shame. Because in this case, they didn't even necessarily have to believe in God, just not do evil. And that really is a testament to God's judgment. Because even though the only way to find salvation and to escape our own imminent demise is to follow God, in this case, they didn't even really have to do that. They just had to not attack an innocent man to avoid this fate. Now, eternally, they would have still suffered the consequences. But right here, they could have avoided that if they had just left Daniel alone and played by the rules. God's judgment does not sleep forever. It comes quickly, and when it comes, it is intense, as these people found out all too well. But on Daniel's side, all he had to do was trust that God was going to deliver him, and he did. Darius believed that God would deliver him, and he did. You see, when you lean upon God, his promises get fulfilled. The promises of these other gods, these other pagan idols that were put up, they don't. And in their case, their biggest idol was not the ones that they worshipped. It was themselves. It was their own goal, their own greed, their own ambition. They decided that nobody was going to stop them from getting what they wanted. Didn't matter how they got it. Didn't matter if they had to cheat. Didn't matter if they killed another person and ended their life to do it. They were going to get what was coming to them. And eventually they did. But it wasn't what they wanted. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media. The theme song for Tactics is Six Foot Town by Big and Rich. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Broadcast studios provided by Cumulus Media Montgomery. Location studios provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2019.